Hey YouTube, here we go with Tactical Tuesday. I hope you guys are uh, ready to go. We're going to talk about uh, custom builds and AR-15s, and we're going to talk about um, possibly even some uh, pistol caliber carbines, customizing them and all that. So hang on tight, and here we go. What is up, my YouTube crazies? My name is Trey Miller with Ghost Tactical, uh, and welcome again to Tactical Tuesday. Uh, like I said in the intro this week, we're going to be talking about AR-15s and uh, 9mm carbines or pistol caliber carbines. Um, we're going to talk about building them, customizing them, and all that stuff. Guys, if you haven't already uh, and you're enjoying it, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down there for me. And engage the live chat, guys. This is not just me and, and, and my buddy talking. This is going to be an, uh, something you guys can send us questions and all of that. So uh, send us when you get in here. Go ahead and say hello in the live chat. Tell us where you're from and any questions you want. So, guys, what we're going to do right now is we're going to get started by introducing a good friend of mine. Um, his name is Kyle Babcock. Um, I've known Kyle for a few months now. Um, he's a gun lover. He's a Star Wars lover, just like me. He's all that stuff. But, um, you know, my biggest thing is going to be he is builds a lot of stuff, uh, built a lot of ARs. A lot of, he builds a lot of weapons in general. So he's got a vast amount. So uh, his name is Kyle Babcock. His YouTube channel is The Feisty Crawfish. Please subscribe to him. Um, he's got a couple of videos up there that are pretty cool. Uh, so welcome, my buddy Kyle. Say hello to the YouTube world and let them know who you are. How's it going, Trey? Thank you. Uh, like you said, my name is Kyle Babcock. Um, give you a little background information on myself. Uh, I'm a graduate of Auburn University, and while I was going to school there, I worked as an armor and a gunsmith for the Opelika Police Department and a few other units in that area. Um, I've got a good amount of experience with the AR platform, the SIG 5.5X platform, and a few other different types of rifles. Uh, like you said, I am a huge gun enthusiast, and when it comes to guns, I am a bit of a special snowflake. You know all the weird shit that I've uh, built and used and currently have and used, but, uh, you know, if you got any questions, I'm your guy. All right. So, um, you know, like I said, once you guys get in here, uh, please go ahead and uh, say hello on the chat and uh, you know any questions that you have and we'll try to get them answered as quickly as we can. Um, Tactical Tuesday guys, when I started this about a month ago, what I really wanted to do was not sit there and have your normal everyday live chat guns but my favorite gun is this and blah 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 blah. I don't care about that stuff. That's just stuff's enjoyment, it's entertainment. But what I'm trying to do with this channel is bring information out for the everyday, something you can put into your everyday life, or if you have questions, more practical stuff, and actually giving out information instead of just trying to entertain with a, with a podcast. So uh, basically what we're going to start out with, guys, is until we get a question and all that, uh, we're going to talk about the AR system in, in general um, and I know that, uh, you know, Kyle, I call him feisty. So if you hear me call him feisty, um, don't worry about it. It's, it's Kyle, but I, I've always kind of called him feisty, but, uh, you know, the, the different uh, systems, you know, you've got, uh, you know, the, the gas systems and, and I know you'll talk about Kyle, but you've got the direct impingement, you got the piston system and the direct blowback. So what I'd like for you to do right now is kind of go through those and explain in basic terms what the difference is, I know the direct impingement's kind of like the uh, the original. I mean, that's that's kind of where the AR started. 
but kind of talk about how it's progressed over time and uh, and the different systems. So have at it. Definitely. So like Trey said, the AR-15 system is typically divided into three subcategories as far as the gas operation. Uh, your first type is direct impingement, and that is essentially where the gas travels through the barrel, through the uh, gas block, and through a tube, and the gas actually makes direct contact with the bolt carrier group. Uh, another older rifle that uses that same system is the uh, Swedish Youngman rifle. Um, it's a bit messy, but it is reliable. Uh, one of the, I guess the detract, a lot of the detractors of that system will essentially say that, well, you're going to get a lot of carbon buildup on your bolt. Uh, it's going to foul up your chamber. You'll find reliability issues because of the carbon buildup inside your chamber and on your bolt. And to an extent, that's correct. However, if you're performing proper maintenance on your rifle, if you've got a coating or a surface treatment like uh, ferritic nitrocarburization on your bolt, or you have some kind of micro slick coating on it, it should be a breeze to clean it. And so in today's world, it's not exactly a big deal with a lot of the advancements we have in coating technologies and uh, surface treatments for our metals. The next system is the piston system. You all know that the AK is a piston system rifle, but it's typically divided into two different types of piston systems. You have the long stroke piston, which is where the piston essentially travels the entire distance that the bolt travels. And then you have a short stroke piston system, kind of like the HKG 36, where the piston actually is spring loaded against a piston head. And the piston head pushes back on the piston rod, which in turn pushes on the bolt carrier. So the piston does not travel that full distance. Now the piston system is a bit more clean running. The gas runs up through the barrel, through the gas block, and is expelled through the front, but it does not uh, come into contact with the bolt group except at the chamber head. Uh, it is a bit more reliable due to the fact that you have less travel of the gas and less fouling in the uh, in the critical areas of the weapon. However, it is more complicated than the direct impingement system and one of the biggest factors in the modern sporting rifle market is that they are typically much more expensive than direct impingement rifles. Uh, some notable examples of uh, piston system AR rifles are the HK MR556, which is a civilian variant of the HK416, the LWRC rifles, and uh, the Adams Arms rifles. The well, next and, 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 and what you're talking about right there, guys, is you know when you when you're talking about different systems of the AR, you're talking about the beginning, the basics. And then you're also talking about the next level of AR, and you're talking about usually more expensive, but it's not just your your low end, your base type AR that you're getting into. Now, obviously, you can build anything you want, but as these systems progress over time, and the inners and the mechanical side of rifling got better, they found different ways. So when you're looking at building an AR-15, you really want to start looking at, if I'm not mistaken, Kyle, but you want to start what your budget is because your budget will kind of tell you what system uh, that you're probably going to be looking at depending on how much you're wanting to spend because you can spend an upwards of, you know, six, seven thousand dollars or you can spend six, seven hundred, six, seven hundred dollars. So, you know, uh, when he's talking about this, different, you know, make sure you're doing your research and saying, well, that sounds great. I want to get what he's getting and then realize, oh, that's a six thousand dollar weapon. Well, you know, make sure you know what you're wanting to get and do your research and, and make sure your budget allows it because it can get some really expensive, but it can also get a really good AR for a, when I, when I say a, a good price, anything under $1,000, I think you can build a really good AR for under $1,000 with all the tricks and whistles, all the attachments, laser, optics, and all that. But, uh, you know, remember that, that, you know, you can go as high as you want, but, you know, you're looking at anywhere from seven to $1,000 minimum which is in a gun world, it's not, a, uh, it's not that much, but don't think you can go out and build yourself an AR for $300. You probably can, but you don't want to shoot that. So sorry to interrupt you, Kyle, but go ahead. No, that's fine. And uh, you're absolutely right. Typically when you're starting a build of an AR, you want to establish your budget. You don't want to go over and you don't want to go under. Um, like I said, the piston systems tend to be a good bit more expensive. However, with systems like the Adams Arms retrofit kits, if you absolutely want a piston system, 
uh, they have retrofit systems where you can actually attach them to former direct impingement rifles and convert them into a piston system. Uh, how reliable those are, I'm not sure, but I'm sure that because they've been around for a while, I'm sure that the most modern uh, iteration of those are much more reliable than they were when they first came out. Um, but definitely budget is a large part of it. And honestly, we're in an era where pretty much everyone and their mother makes AR-15 components. So uh, the price has gone way down there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you can get some factory ARs like Radical Firearms or Adams Arms, or not Adams Arms, I'm sorry, Anderson Manufacturing Builds. Uh, for around five or six hundred dollars, it's and they're made out of yeah. Uh, and you can go down to, uh, for instance, like an Academy Sports and, and pick you up an Anderson. I think um, for four ninety nine, maybe you know five fifty, five forty nine, or something like that. And, and Anderson Arms, are, they're good. I mean, if you're looking for entry level before you decide if you want to build, you know, sometimes it's okay to go and sit there and say, well, I I, I really don't want to spend a thousand dollars yet, but I can go down to Academy or you know, somewhere down there and get one for five, six hundred dollars. And yeah, yeah, they're going to be fine. Uh, so you, sometimes you might want to start there before you decide if you want to go in there. Um, you know, the biggest thing that I can tell you guys is um, with my experience in guns, it's, it's, a, it's a 20 year experience. Kyle's probably got a little more depth experience. Uh, mine's more tactical, more military stuff and then competition shooting. Uh, he, he's the one who's, who's like he said, he's a former SWAT armor. He, he knows exactly the ins and outs of a gun and what makes them work and all that. So, uh, I want to thank everybody again real quick, uh, for watching Tactical Tuesday. We're talking AR 15s and probably some nine millimeter, uh, carbines that, uh, you know, pistol caliber carbines, SBRs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, thank you to Kyle Bobcock, the feisty crawfish. Um, if you haven't yet guys. Uh, go ahead and click that subscribe button. Uh, subscribe to Kyle's channel as well. His, uh, his is uh, the Feisty Crawfish. Uh, I think he's got there on his lower third to where he can tell you where he is. But uh, once again, if you're here, go ahead and say hi. We've got a couple of viewers I see. Uh, go ahead and say hi in the chat for us and uh, tell us where you're from. If you have any questions on customizing or building AR-15s or, or SBRs or whatever, uh, we're going to go through a lot of different information tonight, but we will stop and answer any questions. So go ahead and say hi in the chat. Send us a, a question on the way. Until we get that, we're going to roll on. So head on out, Feisty. Yes, sir. Now to top off the uh, the gas system types, we have one last type, and that's direct blowback. Um, direct blowback is essentially where the gas pressure from the actual chamber of your barrel sends the bolt back and cycles the action. You typically won't see that type of action outside of your pistol cartridge chambered ARs. So anything in 9mm, 40 Smith & Wesson, 45 ACP, you'll typically have a direct blowback uh, gas system. Uh, it's very reliable for low pressure cartridges such as pistol cartridges. And uh, honestly, I would think that it's one of the only ways to go with that. Yeah, I, I know that that's kind of where a lot of people are starting to go. And you mentioned something a few minutes ago about uh, AR lowers and uppers and parts becoming so much cheaper. On the flip side of that, I got a buddy of mine that runs a, a gun shop, and he's telling me the AR sales are so slow right now, and it's basically because so many people are actually building their own right now. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that, and maybe the cost of the ammo. Uh, you know, sometimes a two, two, three, or five, five, six round can get a little expensive. I think the prices are coming down. But going back to what you're talking about, the pistol cartridges. Um, I know you and I had talked a little while ago about me possibly getting a, um, looking into getting maybe a CZ Scorpion or a Beretta CX-4, a, a, a nine millimeter carbine. And mm. some of these carbines are, you know, pistol caliber. The great thing about those is if you, let's say you have a Glock 19, a lot of these SBRs can now be fitted to literally use your Glock magazines. And that's a huge thing when you're talking about an extra expense of, of, of mags and cartridges and all that. So I know that a lot of people are doing that. They're using their Glock or their whatever, you know, uh, their SIG, whatever they, they want. They can get a lot of different uh, cartridges in these these guns. So that's, that's a big plus also. But go ahead. I just wanted to touch on that. Yes, sir. And I think that's one of our talking points later on when we talk about yeah, shooting. Absolutely. Now, uh, as we continue to go over the actual overview, the AR-15s, you also have to take a look at what your receivers are made out of. 
uh, you typically have receivers that are either made out of uh, some certain type of metal um, or you'll have polymer receivers. In my experience with a few of the polymer receivers, they're made to the same size and the same, uh, the same dimensions as a metal AR-15 receiver. And if that's the case, I would actually recommend staying away from them because the polymer has much, uh, much looser and much more different tolerances than the metal AR-15 receivers do. And in some cases, such as with the buffer tube section where you screw in your tube on the rear where your, uh, your buffer and your spring go, mm. uh, they'll fail and they'll crack and they'll snap off because it's, it just can't handle as much force as that spring and that bolt mass going back. But if you have one such as the TN arms polymer lowers where they beef up those sections, you should be fine in the lower receiver. Yeah, uh, would you say that most people now these days that are getting into uh, custom builds are, are staying away from the metal and steel they're going to the polymer a lot more uh, hey real quick uh, my boy Hemi says hey he's not here he's in here I want to say Hemi's from Wisconsin um, so what's up Hemi got any questions uh, for Feisty or myself go ahead and shoot them but uh, but uh, like, like I said Feisty is, is the polymer becoming more and more is it because it's also lighter uh, is it a little more easier for people to handle I would think that across the industry as a whole, polymer lowers tend to be a, more of a staple now with most modern weapons such as the CZ Bren 805 and 806 or even the FN SCARS. Uh, but I would honestly say that with the cost of uh, metal receivers like aluminum and titanium st you know, stagnating right now at very low prices, I haven't seen much of a push towards polymer receivers unless someone wants the weight saving specifically or they just want something different, which is completely okay. Right. Uh, especially if you get something that can handle the, the wear and tear that that traveling bolt mass inside the weapon, uh, you know, presents. Um, I, I know that polymer and on, the, on the pistol side of things now rules the roost. And so, you know, I didn't know if that's something that in the AR world, uh, rifle world that, um, you know, it's 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 probably going to be going down that road when you talk to weight because once they get it out there, I'm assuming the prices will probably come back down eventually for the polymer uh, to where it can compete with the metal. But all I did I didn't know from your side of it is polymer taking over like it has in the pistol world. Not that I've seen. Yeah. Okay. Now, like I said, the other type of lower and upper, well, really both of your receivers, your lower and upper, uh, you have metal receivers. Um, and typically with metal receivers, you'll, the, the most common that you'll see are aluminum receivers, but they're mainly two types of alloys. They're 7075 T6 and 6061 aluminum. 7075 T6 is a little bit more wear and tear resistant and can handle higher forces than 6061, but both are perfectly okay. In fact, 6061 aluminum receivers are usually less expensive because they're easier to mill on the CNC mill. Okay. And if, you, if your receiver is hard coat anodized, it's going to be able to handle any scratches, any wear that you're going to put, uh, you're going to uh, expose it to. Now, when it comes so to if, the, if you're having someone who's just starting out, who has never had an AR or has never built an AR and you're, you're not necessarily want to get the cheapest stuff, but you don't want to go overboard of the two, what would you recommend for the first time builder? I'd probably recommend 7075T6. The prices tend to be uh, about the same depending on where you get it from. Uh, but by far, I would say that 7075T6 aluminum is superior purely from a technical uh, perspective due to the go. amount of uh, forces and wear and tear that it can take as opposed to 6061. Now, your AR-15 is likely going to be nowhere near those forces that would break this metal for either 6061 or 7075T6. But again, from a technical perspective, if you do happen to expose it to that, 7075T6 will outlast the 6061. Now, when it comes to those different types of metals, you also have some outliers in that realm, like titanium or something like that. Uh, they're usually more expensive and it's a newer, it? a newer uh, product that you'll see out there. And it's usually, I would think, for the novelty. Uh, 
but honestly, I don't think that there that that there's a really big drive towards those exotic metal lowers. You know, you can you can usually you can even find uh, some Damascus steel upper and lower receivers, and they look cool, but they're going to be a lot heavier than aluminum. Yes, they are. <laughs> uh, have you? You know, I, I know that the titanium. I've actually seen one. Um, he, he spent probably about four or five grand gold on it, and it looks. I mean, it looks awesome. But once again, unless you're just really wanting to start out, you know, uh, you know, start out on the small side and, and work your way up. That might be your second or third or fourth build if you ever get to that. But uh, unless you just really want to, uh, it was pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie, but I think he said he spent four or five grand total on the whole build, which is, you know, I guess it's worth it for him. I, I wouldn't, but it's what it is. <laughs> I understand. Now, uh, when I, I'm kind of going to shift a little bit of gears here. We're still going to talk about the metal, but um, if you're looking at starting out with your AR-15 build, I definitely recommend an aluminum upper and lower receiver. Now, here's where it gets a little trickier, though. There are different types of aluminum receivers, even in those alloys. You have three main different types of uh, metal production. You have cast, forged, and milled. And the difference between those is that a cast receiver is essentially where there's a mold and you pour molten aluminum or whatever metal you're using into that mold. Uh, and then it's finished and made pretty using a CNC mill. Right. Uh, if, a, if a cast molding is made well, it, is, it, it will last. It will. Unfortunately, casting is a very easy metal production method and therefore not – everyone typically has the best quality control when it comes to cast receivers. So I actually would recommend staying away from cast receivers due to the fact that it's very easily uh, done poorly. Let me stop you real quick. When you talk about cast, uh, just because it kind of goes in that same. And I want to ask you this specifically because I know that you work with 3d printing uh, for a lot of your other non gun issues. But apparently in the last year or so, there has become a little bit of a craze of 3D printing weapons. Have you ever tried it? I have not because I do not have my manufacturer's license, and that would be illegal. Uh, okay. But, uh, you know, you do see some 3D printed weapons out there like the, new, the modern Liberator pistol that was recently – it was made open source – uh, but it only lasts one round because a lot of the filaments and material types, <laughs> such as PLA and the different nylon filaments that you can use for 3D printing, they're not that sh they're not as strong as they could be. Now, a really good industry friend of mine, uh, Tom Bostic, who runs Tommy Built Tactical, actually makes G36 rifle receivers uh, that are 3D printed, but they have heavy really? steel inserts in order to supplement. Okay, so it's reinforced so that it will handle it. Exactly. And you don't see a lot of that with most, you know, at home uh, 3D printers, right? People aren't going to. I think they're probably, a lot of them are probably used, I'd have to imagine, possibly on movie sets, stuff like that, to where it's exactly. more cosmetic and just for looks or hang them on your wall just for having, hey, look at my armory. Well, it doesn't shoot, but it looks really cool. But uh, I, I've noticed a lot of people that are out there, you know, you can find them on eBay, uh, people yeah. talking about, uh, and so I didn't know what it was all about. Exactly. And that's the case. There you go. Uh, the next type of metal production is, uh, our for is forging. Now, with forge, you have a die, which is essentially a, a, it's almost like a mold, but not quite. And what happens is you have a heated metal that's hammered into that die to take the shape that it needs, and then it's finished and made pretty on a CNC mill. Again, kind of like, like a casting. The difference is, is that forge receivers – are much stronger due to that action of hammering it into that mold because it takes what's called the grain of that die. And you're compacting the atoms of that metal uh, even, even farther than they already are as a solid metal. And that's why forged receivers are typically the strongest on the market. Uh, they may not be the prettiest, but they will handle any abuse you can throw at them. Yeah, forging has been around for literally thousands of years, and all of the old swords that people, the samurai swords and all that, those are all forged swords, so they're actually built to take an absolute beating. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to last a long time. Like you said, they're going to be a little bit heavier. Um, 
price wise, what do you think about the price wise? Are they competitive? Are they going to be? And they're obviously probably be less than titanium, uh, probably more than the cast. Are they kind of that middle range if you're talking about uh, price well, wise? Well, I'll let me go. I'm gonna go to the next type, the final type of the metal uh, metal yeah. building, and then I'll go over the cost. So the final type of metal production is milling, or uh, or what you what we call billet uh, billet receivers. Billet receivers, you have a solid bar stock of metal, such as aluminum or titanium, whatever, and you use a CNC mill to create the uh, receiver from that block. They come out looking a lot prettier, but they're not quite as strong as forged uh, aluminum or any forged metal that you're using. Um, that being said, though, they will still handle any wear and tear you could possibly throw at them. Again, they typically match up better between the upper and lower receiver because, again, they're milled from the same block of metal, and they're made to look alike. You're using a CNC mill to create these sharp angles and edges, and they just go together really well. They look good. Uh, they'll tend to be a bit more expensive than the forged receivers, which in turn is more expensive than the cast receivers, uh, but that's typically because of the amount of time that it takes to make them your mill has to essentially create it from scratch, from a piece of metal block. Uh, in all honesty, you can go with billet and you can go with forged, uh, and I won't have a problem with either one. They're, they're both fantastic uh, ways of, uh, of, of making your metal receivers, and they're, they create very strong product. You'll probably wind up spending for a forged receiver mm, – for a set, you should probably spend no more than about 250 to 300 for an upper and lower, depending on what brand you're getting. That's each, right? That's together. That's together. Okay, that's not bad. Yes. And for billet, you'll typically find prices anywhere from 300 to $400. Okay. Now, um, I, I, I guess that's it for the overview of the actual system and the metal types. Now. Yeah, and the, the biggest thing, guys, is like I said, there, there's going to be a lot of issues uh, of, of figuring out what you want. Um, you know, if, if this is going to be your first build, you probably really honestly don't know what you want. Um, you know, so the, the biggest thing I can tell you guys is do your research, kind of find out, once again, your budget. And if your budget is $1,000, then you know figure out what's in this you know what's necessary do you do you really need to have the laser do you really need to have uh you know what kind of stock do you want to have on do you want an optic on there if the answer is yes you got to fit that into your budget as well um but the, the the problem with most people have is they want to go too big too quickly and especially if it's your first build you know if you're building it and you you don't have a whole lot of uh experience in and mechanical engineering type stuff, uh, I would say take it slow. Don't go overboard because uh, if, if you're trying to build something that you're way in over your head, you're, you're basically throwing away money. It's not going to come out right, and you probably could get injured um, if you try to fire it. So take it slow. Make sure you're getting the parts that you need. There are a lot of people out there that you could gunsmith. Uh, I'm sure if you get a hold of Feisty through his YouTube channel and ask him a question, and he'd probably answer it. Make sure that you're doing it the right way and ask the people the right questions because uh, the last thing you want to do is throw your money away. And, and obviously, you can get injured if you build it poorly and try to put a round through that thing. Um, once again, guys, welcome to Tactical Tuesday. Uh, my name is Trey Miller with Ghost Tactical. Uh, on board with me is my good friend Feisty, the V Feisty Crawfish. Uh, Feisty Kyle Babcock is a buddy of mine uh, who's a gunsmith. Uh, he's, he's made some unbelievable uh, weapons uh, that he's shared with me and, and, and all that. And, um, former SWAT armor so he knows exactly what he's talking about so what we're trying to talk about is building an AR-15 or an SBR um, pistol cal caliber carbine uh, and we'll talk maybe a little bit later about customizing at the end if we have to but basically what we've gone over so far is um, the different systems that you that are offered basically in the AR-15 before you start to build, you kind of want to figure out how much you have to spend, what you want to get, and here are the different systems that are available. 
Uh, if you guys haven't already, go ahead and click the subscribe button for myself and for the Feisty Crawfish, his YouTube channel. Uh, Feisty's unbelievable in knowledge. Um, we've only known each other for probably, oh, eight months right now, but, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot and, um, you know, I've shot some stuff his way about uh, I'm looking to get this, looking to get that, and he'll give me some ideas and, and some pointers on what not to get and what to get. So he's a very trusted source for knowledge when it comes to gunsmithing. That's, um, that's right. That's what he's here for. And, uh, guys, if you're here, go ahead and say hello in the chat. Uh, I know we've got a few people watching. Hemi's here. He said, what's up? If you're also watching, go ahead and say, hey, where you're from, and Please ask any questions you want. We're going to keep on going until we get a question. If you get a question, we'll absolutely stop and answer it uh, if we can. Uh, so we've gone over the basic systems of the AR Feisty. Uh, we've gone over the metal types receivers. You know, you have the cast, the forge, the milled, the different types of aluminum. Um, the, the next thing I want to talk about also is, is, is a really big thing when it comes down to uh, if you're talking an AR-15, we're talking usually it's a two-two-three slash five-five-six round. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start talking uh, ten millimeter rounds, uh, you know seven six twos, um, all that stuff. That's that's not really an AR-15. Uh, mm -hmm. AR-15 is typically a five-five-six slash two-two-three, whatever you want to call it. But there are also what they call pistol caliber carbines or nine millimeter carbines or SBR for short barrel rifle. Um, these are more or less nine millimeter. Uh, I guess you could probably, I don't know if you can get them in 40 or not, but they're nine millimeter typically. Uh, mm -hmm. But when it comes down to picking what kind of rifle that you want to build, the caliber is something that does play a part. Uh, yes, I, I, I was in the Marine Corps and I shot the 5.56 round with the M16A2. Great rifle, very simplistic. Um, had its issues, but it was reliable as, as all get out. Uh, for me personally, in, in everyday life, my favorite round is a 9mm round. I've made no bones about it. I don't dislike other rounds, but for me, the 9mm is my favorite round. So I'm actually going to be looking to get a 9mm carbine, maybe a Beretta CX-4 or a CZ Scorpion. Uh, you know, Feisty's telling me a couple others I might want to look in. Uh, I know he's built a couple. He might actually be able to show you a couple tonight. Yeah, um, I actually video. got one right here that I'm getting ready to SBR, and it's just so, a CV. Uh, yeah, so talk to me a little bit about the different caliber options also. You got it. So uh, when you're choosing a caliber, since we're going to relegate this to the AR-15 platform, I'm going to leave out the 308 and 6.5 pre more for another day because those belong to the AR-10 or the LR-308 pattern rifles, which is essentially just a beefed-up AR-15. Now, the first thing that you want to consider when you're looking at what caliber do I get make my AR uh, ch chambered in uh, is your application. What distance are you shooting at? Are you going to be hunting? Are you going to be competition shooting? Is it for home defense? Uh, what are you building your rifle for? Your weapon, when you build it, it needs to be purpose driven and it needs to be driven for that purpose only. Trying to make a weapon that's long range, close quarters and medium range is not necessarily going to work because if you're looking for something that's maneuverable but you want it to extend out long range, well, it's going to be heavier because of that bigger barrel and it's not going to be as maneuverable in close quarters. So uh, we got a question from Hemi. He said five five six versus two two three. Uh, can't see what that says. Oh, two two three wild. Sure. Uh, so two twenty three is essentially the Remington uh, scaled down variant of five five six. It's meant as a hunting round, and I believe that's what it was created with the intention of being. Uh, you can. Chain, you can use 223 Remington in a 556 5 NATO or a 223 Wild uh, chambered AR, but you cannot use 223 Wild or 556 5 in, in a 223 Remington rifle, and that's because of the pr the case pressure. Uh, 556 5 is essentially the same diameter, the same dimensions as a 223, but it has a higher case pressure. So if you put a 556 5 in a 223 chambered rifle. Uh, sometimes you can get case rupturing and have what are called catastrophic failures where it harms you. You can have some big time up. problems. <laughs> exactly. 223 Wild follows that same kind of mindset. It's just a higher pressure, but you, I believe that you can use both 5.56 and 223 in a 223 Wild rifle. 
you know hope that answers your question Hemi keep them coming um, so if you got any more questions guys go ahead and fire them away and uh, if not then Kyle's gonna go in and start talking about the caliber options yes sir so what's your purpose we just talked about it, hunting competition home defense that's gonna play a large part in it now one of the other things that's gonna play a large part in it is your caliber commonality do you have pistols that shoot nine millimeter or 45 if so, then why not get an AR-15 that's chambered in 9 millimeter or 45, just like your pistol? You don't have to have as wide a variety or worried about, worry about separating your ammo. It all fits in the same thing. Hell, if you have a Glock pistol, such as a Glock 17 or a Glock 19, and you have your extended magazines, the 33 rounders, even the, the uh, 17 rounders, why not get an AR caliber carbine that's uh, or an AR pistol caliber carbine that uses Glock magazines? That's right, and we were talking about that a little bit earlier, and uh, I think that's where a lot of people are going. Not necessarily with Glock, but it just in being able to save money. And it sounds crazy, but some of these cartridges and mags can cost a lot of money. So people are trying to save money to be able to throw their pistol mags in their AR and save money on on on, on that. So I mean, I don't blame them. It, it, some of these things can get pretty expensive. Yes, sir. So if you figure out that you have a caliber commonality and that's a big deal to you, then by all means, go for an AR chambered in the cartridge that you already have a stockpile of. Makes sense. Now, let's say you're building something that you just want to have fun with. Are you going to eventually put a suppressor on it or something like that? They now have one of the more popular rounds right now for a suppressed AR is 300 Blackout, and that was yep. designed by AAC to be a suppressed cartridge. It's it's very uh, it, it's a very slow traveling round, and what it is is it's essentially a 762 cartridge that is put into a necked out 556 casing. So you can still use regular AR15 magazines, but you can put your 300 Blackout cartridges in it and fire it in an AR. The only thing yeah, that's and, the cool thing about the 300 blackout, if I'm not mistaken, it is a slower traveling round, and I believe it does not ever, it's not supposed to reach 1,100 feet per second to break the sound barrier, so I think it's it's well below that, and when you add a suppressor to it, I've actually been around uh, an AR that's, that's fired a suppressed 300 blackout, and it is eerily silent. I mean, it is eerily, it, it's... It's pretty cool for that size of a round to be damn near silent. It's it's pretty awesome. That's a the three hundred black has a pretty cool round. Yes, sir. And the best thing about it too is uh, is that you can have a dedicated upper for five five six and a dedicated upper receiver for three hundred blackout, and you can put them on the same lower receiver. They take the same magazine. Yeah. The only thing that's different in a three hundred blackout and a five five six AR is the barrel. You're right. Uh, and really that's about it. You just want to figure out whether, okay, do I want to have to have a different ammo type around the house or do I want to use what I already have stockpiled and what's your application? Are you hunting varmint? Right. Well, that's, that's, that was, the, that was kind of the next question is, is, you know, um, if you're hunting versus home defense versus a three gun competition, uh, you know, there's there's so many different uh, uses for it. So if you can go in and talk about in your in your opinion, you know, let's start let's start with hunting. What kind of caliber would you use for hunting? What kind of caliber would you use if you're going to use an AR for home defense? Um, and then another one for if you're a competitive three gun shooter. And, and, and some of these might be the same thing, but you know, for some people, they might have different reasons for building the AR. So if you can go in and maybe discuss which caliber might be better for those different applications. Exactly. Well, for hunting, it really depends on what kind of game you're hunting. You're not really going to want to hunt deer or elk with a 223. It's just not ethical and it won't <laughs> do that good for you. If and you probably don't want the meat after you shoot it anyways. Exactly. <laughs> but if you're hunting something like coyote or groundhog, maybe even squirrel, you could definitely use a 223 and get away with it. Uh, if you can also use 300 blackout for coyote and 300 blackout is actually very popular for hog hunting as well. Anything yes, it's very popular for hog hunting. Anything bigger than a wild hog, I'd start looking at AR-10 uh, rifles where it's six point ten millimeter round or seven six two round. Really? Yes. Yeah. Um, if you're using home defense, you're usually you're really not going to want too hot of a round. 
Uh, so for home defense, I'd honestly recommend pistol caliber carbines, uh, AR nines, ARs a nine millimeter or 45 or 223. Now some people might say, oh, 223, you know, that's going to travel through this and that and hit somebody behind it. But in all actuality, 223 was uh, designed with a characteristic or characteristic called yawing. And yawing occurs when the bullet essentially tumbles over itself and fragments into pieces. If you're not using a steel core penetrator round like uh, M855 ball ammo, uh, what will happen is once your, once your 223 round passes through your target, it's going to start tumbling because the tail of the bullet is heavier than the front. And as it tumbles, it breaks into small pieces and fragments. And when it fragments like that, as it travels through... It's ripping and causing a lot of damage that way. Yes. And if, say, you miss and you hit something like drywall or a wall, it'll still do that, but those fragments are going to slow down really quickly. So, actually, 223 is a very viable home defense round if you don't want to cause collateral damage to, say, a passerby or your neighbor. All right. We got another question. Um... Hemi says he has a lot of the 762 by 39 thoughts on ARs and that caliber. That's going to be more of an AR-10, but go ahead and, and, and discuss that. <laughs> well, 762 by 39 is the round that the AK is chambered in, and I can understand having a stockpile of that. It was cheap at one time. Um, I've seen a, a couple of ARs in that uh, that are chambered in 762 by 39, and in fact, I think CMMG makes one that takes AK magazines. So if really? you have if you, yes, if you have the ammunition and you have AK magazines, then why not? It sounds like a really fun gun, and they're just as reliable as the 556 uh, AR-15s. The, uh, the AK is uh, interesting, an interesting weapon. Uh, Might be a thought for another time, huh? That's that, that that that's that's a whole nother uh, tactical Tuesday. Um, but no, but Hemi, Hemi I hope. Um, I hope that kind of answers. If not, go ahead and, and send another thought, and we'll touch on that. But, uh, you know, th the funny thing, guys, is is uh, Feisty and I were talking earlier today or yesterday or a couple days ago, I'm not real sure, um, about our different philosophies in home defense. And neither one of us are wrong. Uh, it's just our personal preference where uh, if I had to rank in order – of uh, weapons that I would like to personally use in home defense. My first would be a pistol. Uh, one, I, I love pistols, but uh, for my, for, for me, having a pistol with, using able to use it with one hand and then being able to help people or make 911 calls with the other hand and all that, I would say pistol, then a shotgun, then an AR. Not because I dislike ARs, it's just I think that the pistol and shotguns are more practical for home defense. That being said, Feisty has a different take on that. So what you got? Exactly. You can have 5.56 five, or 223 carbines that are just as maneuverable as a shotgun, some even more so. And with the characteristic of yawing of the 5.56 five, and 223 cartridge, you're less likely to cause collateral damage, like I stated. Plus, nothing, you know, eight rounds of shot, a shotgun in a tube max with, a, with an extension versus – 30 rounds of 223 being pumped into your uh, your burglar or your assailant or whatever it is. I mean, it, it, that I think kind of speaks to it for itself in a, in, a, in a little way, but that's beside the point. For me, there's a more practicality, and I have more hands-on experience with ARs in, uh, in close quarters and home defense situations. Um, Trey might have more with pistols and shotguns, and ultimately it comes down into what are you comfortable with? What do you feel you have more control over? What do you think is going to cause less? less exactly. Collateral? For me, I have. I, you know, the, the funny thing is, is I've I've actually got more experience uh, with pistol and, and, and ARs in my military days. Um, but I like a shotgun better than uh, most of the time. You know, you get you get like a Mossberg uh, Blackwater edition. You can actually, you know extend that to maybe 12, but slugs only, you know, I think you can get slugs only in the media 395, but it's slugs only, but you can get about 12 of them. But you know, that's the cool thing about some of those, those Mossberg shotguns, the tactical shotguns are great, but um, you know, you sit there and this is where Feisty and I had the discussion is, is, you know, for the average person, you don't necessarily have to have the greatest aim for a shotgun. As long as you're at, 
you know, you're talking 20 to 25 feet maximum, usually in home defense. But there's more accuracy that goes into than you think because you have collateral and, and damage that's outside of the realm. But the great thing about a shotgun is very, very, very rarely will those ever penetrate to the outside of the house. Unless you, uh, unless you go shot, through a window. Like <laughs> what were you saying? Unless you're using buckshot or a slug. Oof. Well, yeah, if you use it a slug, it's going to go through a lot. Uh, Hemi says, CMMGs are super expensive, though. Laughing out loud, more than my arsenal, and it's very, very true. But um, he was kind of just giving you an example of what you could do with those 762 by 39 rounds. So uh, I'm sure there are other options out there, but if you've got a stockpile of them, um, unless you just want to hoard them forever, you might as well do something with them, bud. And there, there are other options that are less expensive. I know that uh, PSA or Palmetto State Armory has a, uh, a I think it's a, either a low receiver or a complete rifle called the KS-47. They're less expensive, and they also use AK magazines. Yeah, there you go. So, um, you know, I don't know. Send me, a, send me a message, Jimmy, and let me know why you have a stockpile of those rounds without – uh, a weapon to shoot them with because I'm interested if you're reselling them in the black market or what. I'm interested to know why you stockpiled 762 by 39 rounds with nothing to shoot them with. So I'm just laughing, uh, just making fun of you a little bit. Uh, you know, anyways, uh, continue on, my friend. Yes, sir. So now you've got your application, whether it be hunting or home defense or competition. How accurate do you want your rifle to be? Well, Contrary to popular belief, the longer your barrel, the actually the less accurate your rifle will be. And that has to do with a property of your weapon when it's fired called flexing. When your weapon fires, the recoil impulse is so sudden that it causes a flex in the barrel. Think of when you're at the gym and you're weightlifting and you're doing a bench press and you have heavy weight on either side of that bar. When you go to push up, you'll see the bar start to bend a little bit, right? It's the same thing with barrels. When you fire the weapon, the force on the barrel causes the, and not even just the barrel, the entire weapon causes it to flex. Um, so, you know, if you want your weapon to be more accurate, you want your barrel to be thicker and you want it to be shorter. However, there's a trade off there. The longer your barrel, the more velocity there is behind the actual bullet. So you can actually reach out and touch something at a farther range. So you'll get the distance with a longer barrel. You just won't get the accuracy. Um, but if you want a long barrel for the velocity and you want the accuracy, get a bull barrel, one that's really thick. You'll have less flexing that way. Now, when you talk about barrel length, there's also something to keep in mind called minimum effective barrel length. And that has to do with the ballistics of the round that you're shooting. Uh, let's take a look at 300 blackout, for example. 300 blackout reaches its maximum ballistic profile, I think, at uh, I think it's 10 and a half inches for a barrel, which is one of the great reasons to own a 300 blackout, especially if you're going to suppress it. You can have a short barrel on it, and the suppressor is going to add a bit of length, but without it, it's still it's it's a short barrel. It's compact, it's maneuverable, um, but its velocity and its ballistics do not suffer from it having that short barrel length, whereas with 5.56, five, you lose velocity with that short, shorter barrel length. Now, the same goes if you make your barrel too long. If it's too long, the friction between the barrel and the, and the actual round is going to start to affect how fast it's going, especially if your gas pressure buildup has worn off at that point. I think I've seen a lot of the uh, you know the SBRs and all that, but a very popular barrel length these days seems to be about 16, 16 and a half inches. Uh, can you explain why that in the last year or two? Is it because of suppressors or is it because of the nine millimeter round being able to fire through those shorter barrels? But why has there been such a phenomen phenomenon on the short barrel rifles lately? I'm one of the guys that wants one, so. Go with it. Well, uh, so 16 inches is actually the minimum or the minimum barrel length for something that's an actual rifle. So that's probably why it's really popular Here because you go. and we're talking about form one stuff and form four, which you will get into 
here in a minute on, on the diff different permits just, and all that. Literally just a second. I'll get into that. But there six, you go. <laughs> There's six, a transition for you, folks, live and in person. <laughs> exactly. 16 inches is actually uh, the barrel length that the ATF considers something to be a rifle. So if you want to put a vertical foregrip on it in a stock, then 16 inches, it, it has to be 16 inches. If it's under that, then it's considered a short barrel rifle if you have a stock and a vertical foregrip. And if you don't have a stock, it's considered a pistol. Uh, You've got a, a, an actual weapon that you showed me earlier yeah. that is, at this particular moment, is considered a pistol. Yes, and that weapon is my Bruger and Tom at TP9, and it is my backpacking and hiking gun. In its current configuration, it is a pistol. Now, there's a folding stock that fits right in this rear cutout here. The second I put a stock on this, because the barrel is only, I think, 130 centimeters, I, I don't know what that is in inches. Um, I'm American, man. I, I stick with them. Exactly. Know. Once I put this <laughs> on, because of that, that barrel length being under 16 inches, this will. Be, if I put the barrel on, it'll become a short barrel rifle. If I keep the stock off and I put a vertical foregrip on it, it becomes an AOW, or what the ATF calls it, an any other weapon. And we'll talk about that in just a second, actually right now. So a short barrel rifle is any weapon with a barrel length under 16 inches that is not that does not have or that does have rifling in the barrel that also has a stock, something that's adjustable or foldable, whatever. Um, an AOW or in any other weapon is a weapon that has <clears throat> a barrel length under 16 inches, 18 inches, I believe, for a shotgun. Uh, but also has a vertical foregrip, uh, and I, there's some other uh, qualification for that for shotguns, but I, it, it escapes me right now. Uh, a lot of people you'll see will try to circumvent the NFA laws that define an SBR or an AOW by using either a pistol brace, which is perfectly viable. Hell, I have one on my SIG 553, and uh, it works. And, that, and that's actually a viable actual, you know, that, that's actually something that, is a viable option, not just something to try to get around some, but it actually is an everyday usage of that gun. It's actually a viable option. It's legal. Yes. And um, the ATF has stated that you can put a pistol brace in your shoulder and fire the weapon that way, and it doesn't count as a redesign of the weapon. Uh, that's their most recent ruling letter on it. Um, the ATF's known to change their minds, so please keep up to date with that. I do not want you to get in trouble based on something that I just said that is currently, you know, valid, but maybe out of date, or yeah, maybe outdated in the, in the future. Uh, so it is a, it is an option to have something with a barrel length under 16 inches, but to use a pistol brace on it. SB Tactical makes some fantastic braces for a ton of different weapons, be it the Uzi or the Chris Vector or even an, the AR platform. I know at one point you were a couple of months ago you were actually working on an Uzi. Did you ever finish it? No, I actually had to finish it and uh, I have to like put a coating on it and uh, I wanted to do a really strange camo pattern on it, but I haven't gotten to it. <laughs> Make sure you uh, let us know when you get that done because I want to see that. Yes, sir. But we're now in this realm where we're talking about okay, well, do I want something that has a barrel length under 16 inches? And if your answer is yes, then you have to figure out okay, do I want to put a pistol brace on it? If you do, sure, go ahead. You can shoulder it, everything. But if you want to go with a real deal stock, there are really two different ways that you can go about doing this. If you want to buy something that's already a short barrel rifle, uh, you have to file for a tax stamp with the ATF. It costs $200 whether you're having it transferred to you as an SBR or you're manufacturing it. But you apply for that tax stamp using your personal information and you send in what's called an ATF Form 1 or an ATF Form 4 into the ATF for them to approve it and send you your tax stamp and everything. So ATF, uh, you and I were talking about earlier and explain to them what the difference in a Form 1 and a Form 4 would be. Yes, sir. The ATF Form 1 is for when you are manufacturing your SBR. So if you want to put a stock on something that has a barrel length under 16 inches, then you are going to be – and you, you, let's say you already have that pistol. I already have this TP9. If I put a stock on this, I am manufacturing that SBR. So I would file an ATF Form 1. 
Now, what you do is you can either, and I'll talk about, I'll actually talk about that after I talk about the Form 4. Now, let's say this TP9 already has the stock on it and it's at my dealer and I buy it. Well, I have to wait for my tax stamp to come back, but instead of filing a Form 1, because it's being transferred to me as an SBR, I have to file an ATF Form 4, which is for the transfer of an NFA item. Now, with that, with both of these forms, you're going to fill them out the same way when both, case, both of these cases I'm about to talk about with the same information. But you can either file these tax stamps as an individual where you go in and you – I don't think you have to be fingerprinted anymore. No, I'm sorry. You do have to have your fingerprints taken at your local police department, but they did away with having your chief law enforcement officer sign off on it. So you submit a photo, your fingerprints, everything as an individual, and then you send it into the ATF. They do a background check, and then if you pass and everything looks good and you pay your $200, they'll send you your tax stamp back. You can typically, also typically, guys, if you have a, a concealed carry permit, it's going to be the same background procedurals. That so typically, I, I'm not mistaken. I might be wrong, but in, in Arkansas, where I am, I know typically if you have a concealed carry uh, light permit, um, would that it, it, would that speed up the process to getting that the tax stamp done if if you've already had that background check done for something else, or are they going to do a complete separate one? They'll do a completely separate one. It will not Fantastic. speed up the process at all. <laughs> it's worth a try. Your tax dollars. <laughs> your tax dollars this is government. <laughs> exactly. Now, the other option that you have is filing your ATF Form 1 or Form 4 as a trust or an individual. I'm not, not an individual. Trust or an LLC. Uh, essentially, you create a legal entity that can contain goods like a trust and I definitely recommend the trust over the LLC because you can sign on you can have co-trustees and things like that and beneficiaries in case you pass and want to give it to your kids it works out pretty well just have a lawyer do it professionally I can't stress that enough um, but essentially you file it as uh, with a trust and you do not have to do the fingerprinting and thing well I'm actually not sure about that because I haven't I've done all mine as an individual I don't know if you if you do or do not have to do the fingerprinting or not for a trust. I mean, while you're talking, I'll look it up and see uh, see what Google says. Sounds good to me. But I would definitely think that for passing things down to your kids, if you want it to stay in the family and you want you want you know people other than yourself to have access to it when you're not around, the trust is the way to go. Uh, in, in all honesty, both ways are completely viable. I prefer individual because I don't have any kids right now, and I can always, you know, transfer it to a trust if I, you know, want to do that later on. If I want to make a trust, and if I do have kids, I can pass it down to them. And you can do the same thing as an individual, but you have to have a will that explicitly states that. Um, and that's really the big difference between the Form One and Form Four and the trust and individual. Uh, like I said, they're all viable options, and uh, hell, you don't even have to do it. If you want to stay off the government's radar, then just slap a pistol brace on there. It's just as good as a stock. Yeah, and we were talking about uh, – I didn't have time to really find it. Uh, we, were t we were talking earlier about the difference of uh, the barrel links and, and all of that. So once we're talking about uh, a pistol caliber or short barrel rifle – versus a full-length AR, and, and, and what we're talking about is the difference in what Feisty just showed you is considered a pistol right now. Yeah. Technically, it's a pistol. You add the stock on there, it now becomes a short barrel rifle. And for some of you that have never even seen one, I want to show you uh, something. This is, um, you gotta hear the camera. That's that. That's my AR that I just picked up not too long ago. It's a Core 15. Uh, it's been modified and all sorts of good stuff with uh, lasers and flights and all sorts of an optic. But uh, you know, those are all the, the three basic levels um, of what they are. And, and like I said, I was talking with Feisty last week about. A, a nine millimeter carbine that I was looking at a Beretta CX4 or a uh, CZ Scorpion, um, and he kind of told me um, what to look for. But you know, Feisty's armor 
um, armory, his own private armory, is is pretty, pretty awesome. I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, he sent. I've got. There's no telling me pictures of different things that he's sent me that he probably does not have time or want to show them to the public. <laughs> but it's pretty. It's pretty awesome. He's got some. He's got some really cool things that uh, that he's either made or is going to make. And uh, so, like again, said guys, we're almost done here. We got probably maybe five or ten more minutes. But uh, thank you for watching Tactical Tuesday. My name is Trey Miller. I want to welcome my good buddy Feisty Crawfish, Kyle Babcock uh, from Colorado. Feisty's a gunsmith, um, kind of an all-around do-it guy, engineer. I mean, he's, he's a pretty brilliant guy, graduated engineering from Auburn, I believe. Yep, that's uh, correct. So if I say Roll Tide, is that going to piss you off? or Not uh, really. Care? Because <laughs> You're not from I'm Alabama. I'm a good old Cajun Louisiana boy. That's what I'm saying. There's a reason why he's named Feisty Crawfish. Is, is exactly. he's, he's from Louisiana. Went out, moved out to Colorado several months ago for a job. Um, but no, he's, he's been really good. Uh, go ahead. And, and if you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you subscribe, subscribe to his channel, the feisty crawfish. Um, he's got some videos out there, but, uh, more importantly, guys, um, if you have any questions right now, we, like I said, we've got about maybe five or 10 more minutes. I don't want to go too long. Um, five or 10 more minutes. If you have any questions, say hi in the chat. Um, if you got any questions before we go, go ahead. And if not, the one thing that I really want to kind of start talking about uh, before we go is customizing. And is yeah. there a reason uh, or to stay away from or is customizing actually why people get into building their own AR versus buying? Is it truly because they want to customize it or is it because it's cost effective to build versus buy? Um, yeah. You know, you know, go for it. That, that's, a, that's a fantastic little facet of building your own AR. Um, you are going to you are going to spend more money than you want to if you buy uh, some manufacturer's AR and want to switch out every piece on it to build what you want. Instead of spending that six to seven hundred dollars and then five hundred more on top of that in accessories, like a, a handguard or something, why not build it from the ground up? If you want an if you want a lower receiver that has that special little design on it, the the American flag, whatever you want. Get that instead of having to switch it out later on because then you have something you spent money on that you're going to have to sell or scrap for much less than you, you, know, than you paid for it. Uh, so you'll find that it is much more economically uh, feasible and sound to build your custom, your dream AR from the ground up. Yeah, you might have to put a little bit more labor into it, but building an AR is a labor of love. This is a weapon that you're yeah, going to well, trust. You get done with that gun. You, you can look at it and say, I did this. This is my baby. And, exactly. Uh, so, and yeah. it's, not difficult. it's not difficult to build. There are tutorials on, uh, on YouTube. Now, on the, on the flip side, if you just want – if you want just an AR-15, you don't see yourself uh, customizing more than just the grip or putting a foregrip on it or something like that, then by all means, like your Core 15, get that, put your sight on it, and be happy with it. It'll perform just as well as someone's custom ground-up built AR-15, unless it's a majorly accurized version of it. Uh, you can defend your, your life and your family, your loved ones. You can perform well in competitions with uh, – with a factory AR-15 that's sub $800, or you can perform and do all those things really well with something that you built from the ground up or that was made to what you wanted it to be. Yeah, and I think that's where it comes down to. Um, it all depends on you know what you're wanting out of an AR. And, and we, we talked about earlier, the first thing you gotta figure out is your budget. Okay, what is your budget? If we're talking about someone, their very first build, what is your budget? I want to spend a thousand dollars. The next step in the evolution of this is is building versus buying. What can you get for your thousand dollars? If you don't have the time, nor the machines, nor the the patience or the ability to build, then sometimes you're going to get a great AR for a thousand dollars but it might not be exactly for the same amount of money. You might not be able to get everything else if you build it yourself. It really depends upon what you're trying to do. Uh, obviously, this discussion is about building and customizing, so uh, big advocates on, on that. But 
For those of you that uh, aren't, aren't sure if you want to build and all that, then figure out your budget and, and figure out the how to really cost effectively, you know, figure out what you can get for your money. Maximize your dollar and say, I can get this if I buy it. I can get this if I build it. And is it worth it? And that's only a question that you can answer. Um, obviously, Feisty is a, a, a mechanical engineer. Is that correct? Are you chemical or me you're mechanical, aren't you? Chemical. You're a chemical engineer, but he's still an engineer. So, um, but he's going to be more, you know, in, he's going to go build. Me, I'm a Marine that uh, likes to shoot. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to build mine because one, I don't have the patience and two, I don't have the setup to do it. So I'm probably going to go buy unless I get someone like feisty to build one for me. And then I purchase it and we do the form for uh, transfer and all that. But there's a whole other legality in that. When you start talking about, uh, private manufacturing and selling, that's, 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 that's another discussion as well. But uh, so, you know, it's one of those things where, guys, we, we really wanted to talk to you tonight about uh, AR-15, SBRs, pistol caliber carbines. Um, if, if you were interested in it, I hope we've passed on a lot, a lot of information. Uh, please review uh, the rest of the video if you missed some of it. Uh, Hemi, it's good seeing you, brother. Uh, I'll probably be seeing you in a couple days uh, out there. Guys, once again, uh, thank you for watching. Subscribe to my channel. Kyle, you got any uh, parting words? Go ahead and, and take care of them, brother. Uh, you know, honestly, I, I think that that's about – I've said about everything that I need to say. Just do what you're comfortable with, what you feel your skill set matches as far as building, um, and make sure that you're happy with it. Uh, and if you're not, you can always sell it and try again, right? There's no Absolutely. law against it. Yeah, there's no law against selling your weapon after you buy it, so – by all means, do what you got to do until you find something that you absolutely love. Guys, if you have any questions after this is done live, go ahead and, and um, I believe on my YouTube channel, there's my email, which you can uh, send me an email. I don't know if Feisty's email is on his YouTube channel. If not, you can probably send him a, a message through YouTube that he'll probably be able to check. Uh, I'm not going to go over his personal information, so he can do that if he wants to. But uh, what I will say to you guys is if it's not through us, like Feisty said, there are a ton of YouTube videos, gun forums. There is an enormous amount of information out there to help you, guide you through this process. Do not feel like you're alone. If you're scared to do it, you know, it's okay. Uh, before you start buying all the components, Talk to a gunsmith. Talk to someone who's actually built it. Ask them for their advice. Like I said, my gun advice, when I when I start talking about that kind of stuff and, and ARs, Feisty's my guy that I'll say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, doing that. What do you think? And he'll sit there and say, yeah, that's pretty good, but what if you did this, this, or this, or you know, look at that. So there's always someone out there that's been there and done that. So uh, utilize that knowledge um, and all and that. And on that, same, on that same note, uh, if, if you want to build it on your own but you don't feel you have the skill set, if you have a gunsmith that will build it for you, then ask them to shadow them and look over their shoulder while they're putting it together. That's the best way to learn. That's how I learned how to, do, how to build my ARs. When I was working as an armor, I asked the guy, hey, do you mind if I sit here and watch it so that I know what I'm doing? And so I did, and now I'm pretty proficient at it. I would say so, yes. Uh, so, guys, like I said, thank you again for joining us for this week's episode of Tactical Tuesday. Once again, my name is Trey Miller with Ghost Tactical. You've got Kyle Bob Babcock, the feisty crawfish. Guys, That's we've me. enjoyed it. Uh, check out our channel. Subscribe to the channels. Watch the videos. Do all that good stuff. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday for another edition of Tactical Tuesday. Until then, guys. Keep shooting and, uh, you know, and all that stuff. But uh, more importantly for me and my fellow Marines, Semper Fidelis.